All right, my dudes, hello, welcome. Um, so this is just going to try and be as quick a tutorial as possible covering what we've done in our lesson this week, and that is our bouncing ball tutorial. Now I'm going to, at the very end of the video, add a couple of extras, such as how to go about putting in a background, how to go about adding a little bit of audio, which I'll link to the assignment as well as an extra credit piece. And um, then I'm going to cover how to go about rendering this file. Okay, so this first half will be the bouncing part, and then the second half will be all of these little extras. Okay, so starting off in After Effects, we are going to hit New Project, and we're going to click New Composition Settings. Now, remember we went through these during class. We always want to make sure that our preset is set to HDTV 1080 25. That just means that our screen dimensions, our width is 1920 by 1080 pixels height. That's full HD. We make sure that our pixel aspect ratio is set to square pixels. Frame rate is set to 25. Resolution can be set to full. And just to follow along, or rather to follow the method that we used in class this week, we're going to stick with just a 10 second timeline. So that's going to read 0, 00, 0, 10, 00, 0. And we're going to say OK. Cool. Now that we have created our workspace, the first thing that we need to create a bouncing ball is to create our ball. So I'm going to go up to my shape tool, shortcut for which is Q, and clicking and holding, I'm going to click and just release when I'm hovering over the ellipse tool. And that's going to allow me to, while holding down shift, click and drag to create a perfect circle. All right, not too big, something just like that should be fine. Now I did point out in class, an annoying little step that occurs inside of After Effects is as soon as I try and either grab my pan behind tool or my selection tool, it essentially kind of half deselects that shape. We no longer see the anchor point anymore. So in order to fix that, we just need to click off of our shape, click back onto it, and we can now move our anchor point using the pan behind tool. All right. Now, we want to make sure that our ball bounces uh, or rather squashes and stretches from the correct position. So we're gonna make sure that we place our anchor point right here in the bottom center of our ball. I'm gonna hold down Command on a Mac or Control on a Windows and it is automatically going to snap to that bottom point for me. Now, whenever I scale my asset, it's gonna scale from this point and it's gonna look as though it's actually making contact with the floor. Hit V for my selection tool and zoom out a little bit and we are almost ready to begin animating. I want us to get into the habit of labeling our layers correctly. So once we've created our ball, you'll see that it makes a layer in our timeline known as shape layer. I'm going to, with that layer selected, hit the return key or the enter key on my keyboard. And I'll call that ball, hit enter again to lock it in. All right, we can't interact or rename a layer by double clicking on it. You get a little dumb, like that little ding sound to let you know that that's an invalid command. In After Effects, you have to hit enter to rename a layer. All right, next, we need to create a floor. Now, I'll show us how to go about using shape layers to make a basic floor in a moment or at the end of the um, animation. But for now, let's go up to View and let's make sure that we have Show Rulers selected. Shortcut for those Command or Control R. Clicking on that will reveal our horizontal rulers at the top of our composition panel and our vertical rulers to the left of the panel. All right. Now, my mouse, you can see, is a normal mouse until I hover over these two elements. And that essentially allows me, or indicates rather, that I can click and drag and I can use these rulers to place guides on my screen. Now, the guides that we place are not real per se. They're not going to be in our rendered video but they are there for us, for us to work with, make sure that everything that we work with is aligned. And it's going to guarantee that our ball is always bouncing off of the floor correctly. Okay. Once that's done, we can go up to view and we can select lock guides. That's going to make sure that I can't accidentally move the position of my floor. And that's going to guarantee that I never have my ball bouncing slightly higher or lower than a previous point of contact. Okay. Going up to view and clicking show rulers again or simply hitting command or control R to then hide those ruler inputs, freeing up some space for us on screen. Okay, now that we've set up our space, we can actually start animating. Now, in order to follow the same sort of process that we used in class, I'm just gonna move my indicator in my timeline to the one second mark. With my layer selected, I'm gonna hit P for position and that's gonna open up my position property. 
I need to turn that property on and create my very first keyframe by clicking on this little stopwatch that appears immediately to the left of the word position. The stopwatch will turn blue and it then generates a keyframe for me. And the keyframe is automatically blue because it is selected. If I click off of that and just move my indicator out the way, you'll see that it is an off gray color when it is not selected. And these keyframes are not set in stone. As we covered in class, we will be re-timing these. But for now, we can simply leave it here on the one second mark. Shifting down my timeline to the two second mark, I'm simply gonna click and drag my shape horizontally down until it snaps with that ruler. Now, if yours is kind of not, you'll see not automatically magnetized and sort of snapping to that ruler, we just need to go back up to view and make sure that snap to guides is turned on. This means that any time an asset with an anchor point gets close to that guide, it will automatically snap to it, guaranteeing that our ball makes contact with the floor. Going over to second number three, I'm just gonna very roughly and very quickly now begin dragging my ball horizontally up and down across the screen. And for every second on our timeline, every even number, it's going to make contact with that ruler. And every odd number, it's gonna be up in the air. Now, I don't need to worry about placing the ball correctly the first time around. So say, for example, I could just very roughly make an incorrect bounce here at the end before coming to rest. And the reason that I can do this is, as we pointed out in class, these little squares that we have visible to us in our composition panel, these represent the keyframes. Notice, for example, this is my third little square on screen. Clicking on that will automatically select my third keyframe. All right, so I can hope you can hear me over the noise in the background. Now, I can adjust and interact with these keyframes at any given point. So, super rough, doesn't matter if I don't get the ball in the right place the first time around, I can always reposition them. All right, now that's a little bit quieter. Okay, so with my ball selected, we can now see that we have created this basic path across the screen, and it really can be as messy as you want it to be at this point, because we have one step of refining to do for this path before we can begin working in the timeline. A tool that I wanna introduce you to now is the pen tool. Shortcut for which is G, can be found immediately to the right of the ellipse tool and to the left of the horizontal type tool. Okay, it looks like an old nib. Clicking and holding there gives us access to the Convert Vertex tool. Now the Convert Vertex tool is an exceptionally powerful tool for those of you who start working in Illustrator for whatever subject it is that you're studying, you'll become very familiar with this tool. But in After Effects, this tool allows me to adjust the path along which my action is occurring. As soon as I hover over any of these little squares that represent the keyframes that we have created, you'll see that it then turns into the same symbol that our tool shows. Now, by clicking on these little squares, what I'm doing is I'm removing the roundness from these paths. This is going to remove the illusion of our ball sliding off of the floor as opposed to actually bouncing. This is also a fantastic opportunity for me to quickly grab my selection tool and to start repositioning these points so that I can create a more natural looking bounce and I can really just shift these around however I see fit. So I'm just going to shift these up slightly, something like that, and I think that we should be good. Okay. Next, playing this back or scrubbing through rather, we've created the illusion that our ball is making contact with a hard surface and bouncing off of it. But at the moment, we now have a zigzag pattern that is not a believable bouncing arc. So we're going to grab our Convert Vertex tool again. And for all of these frames that are in mid-air, we are going to click and drag slightly to the right. You'll see that as soon as I do that, it introduces these little handles. And these handles allow me to affect and change the path along which my action is occurring. So by only interacting with the keyframes that are in mid-air, we have now created a ball that actually follows a believable bouncing arc process. Okay. Now what we have at the moment is a very boring, monotonous, drawn out bounce. So the next thing that we need to add to this is easing. All right, and in order to add easing to our keyframes, we need to have all of them selected. So we can simply click and drag to select all of these pos uh, position frames. Or alternatively, because we're not trying to be picky about which ones we're selecting, we can simply click on the word position and it will select all of those frames for us. 
What we're gonna do now is apply easing by either right-clicking on one of these blue keyframes, hovering over keyframe assistant and selecting easy ease, which will apply easing to our keyframes. Hitting F9 on your keyboard will apply easing to your keyframes. So simply hitting F9 will also then apply easing. All right, so you can tell that a keyframe has got easing applied when it has turned its keyframes into these little hourglass shapes. All right, playing this back now, what's happening is After Effects is going to speed up and slow down between each of these little frames. So at the moment, our ball starts moving slowly, it speeds up, but then it slows down before it hits the floor, which is not what we're looking for. In order to affect this and change it, we need to dive into the graph editor. The button for the graph editor can be found here, immediately to the left of the visual timeline. And you need to have a keyframe selected when you go into the graph editor. Without a keyframe selected, clicking on the graph editor just opens up this little grid box over here with no information inside of it. Selecting one of our keyframes and selecting our graph editor now provides us with visual information for the speed at which our action is occurring. All right. Now something that I'd like to point out, please don't get confused between the similarities that we have um, here between our path and the graph editor. Notice that I can break my path and pull these keyframes in any direction, but the graph editor will always have speed bumps. All right, graph editor shows us the speed of an action, not the path of an action. Should you open up graph editor and you're not seeing this particular layout, if you're seeing something like this, which is a bunch of red and green lines, this simply means that you've opened up into a different view for the graph editor. This is known as the value graph. We do not touch the value graph, we simply need to right click in this workspace and make sure that edit speed graph has been checked and you'll be seeing these little bumps. All right, next, in order to now start telling After Effects how we want this action to occur, I wanna point out that these little yellow squares over here represent the keyframes that we have in our composition panel as well as obviously outside of our graph editor here in the timeline. Okay, we're gonna hover over our second keyframe and you'll see that when I select that little yellow square, I get two little handles to the left and right that are immediately attached to my keyframe. And then I have one handle far removed to the left and one handle far removed to the right. These handles are what allow me to tell After Effects how I wanted to interpret the movement that's occurring on screen. All right. As we saw, saw in class, we are going to pinch these handles as close to that little square as we can. We're also then going to grab the handle one removed to the left and pinch it as close to our keyframe, reselect it and grab the handle to the right and pinch that as well. What we've essentially done now is we have made a peak in our graph editor. We've told After Effects that it needs, our, our ball needs to pick up speed as it starts falling. It needs to reach maximum velocity as it hits the ground and it needs to leave the ground with the same force. So if I play that back, boom, we've got a somewhat realistic looking bounce taking effect. We need to create this peak every time our ball hits the ground. So for every um, even numbered keyframe at the moment, two, four, six, and to some small extent eight, we are going to be pinching these handles and creating these peaks. Should you find it difficult to perhaps navigate this um, time sort of space here or if you're finding that your handles are a little bit too small to interact with comfortably remember that you can zoom in and out of your timeline using these little buttons over here as well as the slider you can also use the plus and minus keys on your keyboard so I'm going to zoom in slightly and pinch these handles for our eighth second over here we don't want to pinch the handle all the way on top of the ball or all the way on top of the keyframe rather, we kind of just want a very small little hump at the end, which gives our ball a little bit of action. Okay, so this is the pattern that we have now created. Every time our ball is in mid-air, we have created a trough, this little gap between our peaks. And every time the ball is in mid-air, we have got these peaks that then determine that our ball hits the ground at its fastest movement. Now playing this back, something that we can see taking place, especially here, is as our ball is bouncing, it comes to a complete stop in midair before it continues falling. 
Now that's obviously not what happens in real life. And the reason for this, if I hover over my third keyframe here and zoom all the way in, is because this keyframe is sitting on the zero pixel horizon line. So this means that it's coming to a complete stop before it continues with its motion. In order to fix this, what we can do is simply click and drag these little yellow squares. You'll actually see that there is two squares if you click and drag them up. And we're gonna get them off of that hor uh, zero horizon line. This is going to essentially tell After Effects that even though this is the slowest rate that our ball is moving, it is not coming to a complete stop. Something that I want to point out, however, and something that should be pretty clear here at the end, we can definitely pull these handles too high. Notice that as I pull this angle or this uh, keyframe up, that it affects the curve of the line as it continues to the next frame. So you can definitely pull these too far up off the, the, that um, horizon line. So we kind of want to just practice a little bit of subtlety and just make sure that we're only rising those points enough to get them off of the zero mark without breaking the peaks that we have now created. When done correctly, our ball no longer hocks fuss in midair and it moves across the screen nice and smoothly. All right, we're done with the graph editor for now in terms of our position. We've got our basic movement down. The only thing that we need to fix now is the fact that everything is occurring at the same rate. Obviously, as our ball bounces across the screen, as its bounces get smaller, its energy is dissipating. So it's not gonna take a whole second at the end of our um, animation for it to hit the ground, as it would at the very beginning. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start shifting our keyframes, bringing them closer together. Now, something that I'd like to introduce, as was in class, we have a few ways of interacting with the timeline in terms of navigating up and down the, the space itself. We can simply click on these numbers, right, in this little time ruler, and that'll move us around roughly. We can click and drag our little indicator, and that'll move us across up and down the screen as well. Or we can use some keyboard shortcuts. Page up on a Windows, page up and page down on Windows machines, page up will send you to the left, page down will send you to the right along the timeline. On a MacBook, if you're using one like myself, holding down Command and using the left and right arrow keys will shift you up and down the timeline by individual frames. If I hold down Shift and hit Page Up or Page Down, or holding Shift, holding Command on a Mac and using my left and right arrow keys, I can jump up and down the timeline by a value of 10 frames per click as opposed to just one. So this is a great way to count out your frames, allowing you to essentially just decrease the spaces between our keyframes. To put this into a practical example, I'm gonna select keyframe three to eight, and either hitting page up or holding down command and hitting my left arrow key, I'm going to count five frames to the left. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm just going to then, now having, clicking and dragging my selected keyframes, just overlapping it with this time indicator. If I hold down shift, it will automatically snap that keyframe to my indicator and that has now removed five frames between keyframe two and three. Moving over to keyframe four, I'm gonna count out eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm gonna shift up, deselect, and continue. The next one can be 10, 12, 15, 20. Your counts don't need to be the same as mine, just as long as the gaps between your keyframes are getting consecutively smaller to help sell the idea of that dissipating energy. Okay, something like that. Playing this back now, we have a slightly more believable representation of that energy dissipating. Okay, I can see that it does hock fast a little bit in the air at the end, and I can go back and refine that by simply going into the graph editor. If I take a look at how my graph reads here, I've made this peak a little bit too intense. It's kind of slamming our ball down at the moment. So I can actually just round or smooth that out a little bit. Something like that. And we'll be doing fine. Okay, now that we've retimed our keyframes, we've got a lot of dead air to the right of our animation that we don't wanna to have to play through every time. And what I can do to shorten this playback speed is I'm just gonna come here 
just before the six second mark. And I am going to hit N for NATO on my keyboard. That will then adjust the end point of my preview space in this timeline. Alternatively, you'll also notice that on the end of this gray bar here, there's a little blue head and simply clicking and dragging that will allow me to decrease or increase the length of this playback space. I'm gonna to go to the very beginning. We've got a full second of no action occurring. So what we're gonna do here is maybe just a couple of frames before our very first keyframe. I'm gonna hit B for beginning and that is going to set the starting point for my animation. And this is then going to create a shorter animation playback section. All right. So what we have now done is we've applied easing, we've created a believable reaction to the ball bouncing across the screen, and we have decreased the space between our keyframes to ensure that the ball is correctly losing energy along the way. What we wanna do now is introduce scale so that we can start introducing squash and stretch, another one of our 12 principles of animation. In order to do that, I'm gonna select my ball layer Holding shift, I'm gonna hit S on the keyboard to add the scale value to the properties currently listed on screen. And I'm gonna click on the stopwatch to create my very first keyframe. Now, what I'm gonna do is before we begin animating the squash and stretch, I'm gonna right click on my little keyframe over here and I'm going to select toggle hold keyframe. Okay, so I'm right clicking on the blue keyframe for scale, toggle hold keyframe and I'll explain what that does in a moment. Moving down to align ourselves with the second position keyframe, the fantastic thing about a ball bounce exercise is that the position keyframes act as excellent guides for where we should be putting our initial scale frames. We know that every time the ball hits the ground, it's going to squash a little bit, so that's where we'll create our frames. Now, at the moment, I want my ball to squash down on impact, but as soon as I try to interact with my two values, my ball simply shrinks or grows. And that is because both values are linked. You'll see immediately to the left, this little link icon. If I hover over it, it says constrain proportions. And by clicking on that, I simply turn it off so it disappears. And I can now interact with the two properties separate to one another. Okay. Let's type in a value here, 120, 80. All right, now I did just, um, explain in class, but let me actually just do that again. When we are working with our squash and stretch for um, an asset, we need to maintain our volume. We never need our ball to, to actually shrink and grow in terms of mass when it hits the ground. It's simply being distorted and its insides are being displaced. So one of the best ways to make sure that we maintain our volume is simply making sure that our two beginning scale values always add up to the same total. 100 and 100 adds up to 200. I know then that I can type in 120 and 80. Still adds up to 200. I haven't added or taken away any mass from this ball. I have simply displaced it. All right. You'll notice as soon as you do that, you get a new keyframe that has been made for you, except this keyframe now looks like a square. And this is the visual representation to show you the toggle hold keyframe has been applied to this frame. Okay, what toggle hold does is it tells After Effects to only adjust the um, properties that have been animated when a new keyframe tells it to. So it doesn't go and automatically sort of add in between frames here. It's only going to squash my ball when my little blue indicator overlaps with that held keyframe. Okay. Moving over to where my ball is in mid-air, I can be nice and lazy. I'm just going to copy and paste my very first scale keyframe. That would be Command or Control C for a selected keyframe, and then Command or Control V to paste that keyframe in line with your time indicator. All right. We know that the ball is going to be a perfect circle every time it is in mid-air, so I can actually go and align myself with those position frames and simply hit Command or Control V to paste the frame my scale frame that says it will be a perfect circle in midair. Okay, now you'll see that these toggle hold frames look slightly different, and that is simply because when you set a very first keyframe to have toggle hold, it looks like a hybrid between a diamond and then the flat end of the square. All right, normally these would look like squares, but because I'm copying and pasting that particular frame, these ones maintain its visual cue. Moving on to the next time the ball hits the ground, I'm gonna copy my very first impact frame, copy and paste it there, 
and then I'm going to reduce the difference between my values. So for example, we could have this read as 11585. I'm going to copy this keyframe and move down to my next point of contact. I'll paste it there and change the values to read 11090. I'll copy this frame one more time, place it in line with my final position frame, and the value can read 10595. It's very important that our ball has a slight displacement of mass when it comes down on its final contact with the floor, so that we have this little blip of action at the end. If we don't, if we bring it down as a perfect circle at the end, it looks as though it's died halfway through its bounce, and we don't want to lose that sort of spark of life that we've been injecting. Okay, playing this back, you'll see that your ball now pops back and forth between being a perfect circle and squashed. And again, that's because After Effects has been told not to fill in any in-between frames yet. It's only changing visually when a new scale frame tells it to. Cool, so we've got our initial planning done. We've got a keyframe for every time the ball is in midair, and we've got a frame every time the ball hits the ground. So essentially we've got our normal neutral pose and we have got our squashed frame. Now we need to add our stretching frames. In order to do this, we're going to align ourselves with our first point of contact. I'm gonna copy this keyframe for scale and I'm gonna move three frames to the left. One, two, three, and I'm gonna paste it. I'm then going to invert these values. So rather than reading 120, 80, it can read 80, 120. And that is now the stretched version of this particular frame. I'm gonna copy that move three frames beyond my point of impact, one, two, three, paste it there, and I now have my stretch, squash, and stretch frames. Every time our ball hits the ground, we're going to have a cluster of three scale frames. One before it hits the ground, showing its stretched value, one as it hits the ground, and then one after it's hit the ground. Okay, moving along to the second time we hit the floor, so that's our fourth, um, position keyframe over here. I'm going to copy my scale frame, three frames to the left, one, two, three, paste it there, and invert my values, 85, 115. I'll copy that, three frames to the right, one, two, three, paste it. And we're going to rinse and repeat for every time the ball hits the ground. When we get to our final point of contact, we're gonna copy that keyframe, three frames to the left, one, two, three, paste it, invert those values, 95, 105, and then three frames to the right, one, two, three, that's where we can then have our ball be a perfect circle, 100, 100. Okay, cool. So we have now created clusters of little scale frames for our ball to abide by. What we can do now is we can click and drag to select all of these scale frames. Please make sure to not accidentally select your position frames. Scale frame selected, and then we can either hit F9 on our keyboard or right click keyframe assistant, easy ease, and that will apply easing for us. Hitting spacebar to play back, we now have a gooey ball bouncing across the screen. Okay. However, we're not done yet because we still need to go into the graph editor. As a prime example, oops, don't double click there. As a prime example for the reason why, notice how my ball is stretching way too soon at this stage. It's not moving fast enough at this point to begin having its body deform. So we need to tell After Effects to essentially reinterpolate that information. With one of our scale keyframes selected, I'm gonna dive into the graph editor and we're gonna notice that this looks slightly different than our position graph editor counterpoint. The reason for that, the reason why we have red and green lines is because After Effects is reading the width and the height as two separate values. Ergo, each of these values need their own little sort of visual piece of information. We're going to simply follow the same rule that we did earlier. Every time our ball hits the floor, we're gonna zoom in on the timeline and we're going to start pinching in these handles. Now, what we're going to do is a slight exercise in subtlety. Rather than sucking these little handles right on top of the square, we're gonna create just a little bit of a peak on either side. 
And this is going to guarantee that our, we actually have a couple of frames to show the change taking place. If we have it take, to, take place too quickly, what we actually end up doing is kind of hiding the fact that we have stretched the, the asset at all. Okay. I'm just gonna try and keep that to be roughly equal on both sides. And every time we have these tight little loops, this is where the balls hit the ground. We're gonna to continue to bring these handles in. And be a little bit subtle with them, like so. check how it's looking by simply sort of moving back up the timeline, hitting spacebar, clicking, seeing if you're happy with the way that it is moving. Now, when it comes to this little blip that we have at the end, this is kind of this little section of our ball coming to rest here at the end. Again, we're going to be super subtle with this. Only just a little bit of a bounce on the end to sell the idea that this character is coming to rest as opposed to having fallen dead in midair. Something like that, maybe. Yeah, okay. Then, that's pretty much all we did in class, was working with those loops there for our point of impact. But we do need to still work with the information leading up to those hits, or to those jumps, okay? So what I'm doing now is I've aligned myself, if I leave the graph editor quickly, I've aligned myself with my first stretch keyframe. All right. And what I'm gonna do is I'm again, I'm gonna pull these handles, not too harshly. We do want to actually see the change occurring, but I'm going to push the handles away from the very first keyframe, dragging them to the second keyframe. And that's gonna make sure that my ball doesn't start stretching before it um, actually starts picking up speed. Boing. Now we can align ourselves with the keyframes where our ball is in mid-air. Okay, and what we can do is every time we uh, align ourselves where our ball is in mid-air, we are going to push the handles away from ourselves. The reason why I'm doing this is I'm telling After Effects to make sure that the ball bounces up into a perfect circle before it gets to the apex of that jump. All right, so you see that by pushing my handles all the way to the left and all the way to the right, I have told After Effects that the change that's occurring begins closer to after the ball hits the ground or closer to when the ball hits the ground rather than up in midair. Moving down the timeline, align myself with where my ball is in midair and push the handles away essentially in the direction towards the peaks that we made when our ball hits the ground. Again, this is an exercise in subtlety. You don't have to push these all the way to the left or right. We can try and... Here, for example, I feel that that change is maybe a little bit too harsh. So I'll just realign myself here and just soften out that curve a little bit, like so. And we'll do the same here at the end. I think these curves are a little bit too heavy, so I'll pull them back a little bit. Okay, and playing these back, we now have a ball successfully bouncing across the screen. Leaving the graph editor, coming back out here. Cool. Hitting space by playing this back, we've got the basics. Before we dive into then adding audio or things like that, let us tell After Effects that we only want this highlighted area to be in our timeline. It doesn't help that we have all of this dead space to either side of it. It's kind of taking up valuable real estate. So in order to do that, I can simply right click on this gray bar, the work area bar, and select Trim Comp to Work Area. 
to do that again, I'm going to right click on this little gray bar over here, trim comp to work area, and it's going to essentially just fill up the timeline with this um, workspace as opposed to having all of those dead frames on either side of it. Okay, cool. Now, we've essentially done what's necessary for the submission assignment. 